By the way, did everybody get my email last week? Raise your hand. If you, it, raise your hand if you were here last week and you didn't get it. You didn't get it. So, so a couple of you, okay. Just make sure. All right, hey, 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 here, here's the deal. Come on in, Kev, right up here. Make sure that the email address that you have is accurate, and I apologize if it is accurate, because something, something goofy happened, then I, I don't know what, because I'm usually pretty, pretty good at that kind of stuff. So uh, I'll mail you something again this week, maybe tomorrow. Just hip, hip, and rain the fact that you guys were here. I did receive a lot of questions from, from you. And um, I answered a lot of them. If you didn't get an answer from me, it's simply because I know somewhere down the line we're going to talk about your question. And keep in mind, it takes you 20 seconds to ask a question. But it may take 30 minutes to write an answer. And if all of you were asking questions, sometimes it's just impossible for me or my staff to write an answer out. And, and let me just give you a little thought here. I love to hear from people. The shorter your email is, the better. <laughs> if you send me something that's 40 pages long with you know, a link to your favorite preacher and, and a, you know, 38 pages of something that they wrote, I, I'm not going to read it. I can't. It would be impossible with all of you and 5,000 people who go to church here, okay? And it's not that I don't want to read all the articles that you send me. I'm sure they're fantastic. I'm sure they're great. I'm, I'm sure of all that kind of stuff. But the shorter they are, and you boil it all down, you just bore down on it and say, here are the three sentences, and you get there. And what that does is it forces you to kind of think through, what is it that I really want to ask? And you just got to kind of think it through, boil it all down, and say, okay, here it is. Here are the three things that I'm just wondering about. I was reading the, the, the lesson, and I got lost. I didn't know what this meant. Or you said something in the sermon. Or my Uncle Joe used to teach me this. You know, boom. Just get it to me, and I'll do my best um, to... Uh, answer all those questions. Okay, if you were here last week, everybody got their little bookmark, right? And if you weren't here last week, Luan, do we have those? Okay, uh, there's a whole bunch of guys, uh, a, a lot of my staff is gone this week. They're all on uh, um, at conferences and retreats. And so Levon's in charge of the church this week. And I just kind of go along with whatever she says. Uh, or... Yeah, hey, if, you, if you're here this week, I, we make up a little bookmark for you that has all the books of the Bible in their order so that when you open your Bible and you do your, your study and they say, hey, turn to this book, this helps you know, okay, here's where, where, where it's at. And this is just a tool for you. Now, here's the deal. There'll come a moment when, when, you, when you won't need this anymore. Okay? Some of you may not need it now. But probably most of you do, and that's okay. Every, I needed it at, at some moment. And this is just a tool for you, and so if you're new, uh, you can pick that up a, a little bit later, and it'll be a great, great help to you. I usually keep mine in my Bible all the time, and sometimes I, I'll just give it away to people when I see them on the weekends or whatever, and it's just, um, it's just a, 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 a tool for you. Um, this week, when, when you leave... Um, I told you that most weeks we have gifts, okay? Last week it was that $80 bookmark, <laughs> solid, solid plastic, unbelievable. Um, this week, when you, when you leave, we've got a CD for you, and I think uh, all of them are, are this one. We take our uh, bands, and we have a lot of great musicians here at our church, rarely do you ever see all of the, the best guitarists, best drummers, best bass player, singers, all on the platform together. That's rare because they're, they're everywhere on campus doing all kinds of stuff. It could be at the venue or whatever. But uh, we have um, maybe some of the finest musicians any place. 
And usually once or twice a year, we send them into the studio to record an album. And this is the, the album we're gonna give away to you tonight. So when you leave, you can all pick one of these up. This is all original music. In other words, our guys and gals in our, our worship department, they wrote all these songs. And uh, this is really fantastic. Uh, a lot of the albums that we do, they just, you know, take some of the popular songs that are out there on K-Love or whatever it is, and we'll sing them. But sometimes we send them into the studio and they've written all their own music. And so um, you'll all get one of these uh, on your way out. And here's the deal. This is the kind of stuff you ought to be listening to. I know that for some of you, you know, it may not be the style or the genre that you're used to. Um, but what you're filling your mind with matters. And um, I can tell you that most of the stuff that you hear on the radio or whatever is just, is just crud. It's crud. And when you fill your mind with that kind of stuff all the time, it'll, it'll make a difference in your life. It's amazing how your brains work. In fact, let, let me do a little experiment here with you. I don't know whether this will work or not. Kind of make this stuff up as I go. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I'm going to show you the power of your brains. I'm going to, I'm going to rattle off a line of a song. And what I want you to do is when you hear the song, when you hear the line, I want you to say the next line that comes to your mind. This is a song that was popular about 25 plus years ago. Guarantee it, you haven't heard the song, I'll bet, in 10 years, most of you. But it was super popular about 25, 30 years ago. And we're just going to see how well your brains work. Okay, here we go. Ready? So I'm, I'm going to say the line, I'll sing the line, and then you sing the next line. Just wh whatever's there, okay? We'll see how, how, how good the brain is that God's given you. Okay, here we go. It goes like this. It goes, it goes eight, six, seven, five. Three, yeah, right. Okay. Now, now here's the deal. All of you have a, a horse telephone number memorized. You see, for a good time... You called that number, and it was on a bathroom wall. For a good time, that was the number you called. Her name was Jenny. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Nobody, you know, uh, sat down and heard the song and wrote it down. Hey, eight, six, seven. You didn't do that. You just heard the song so many times. It got lodged in here. And so you have a prostitute's phone number memorized. <laughs> what else is up here that you don't even know about? See, about 20 seconds ago, that was something up in this thing called your brain you had no idea was stored there. You just heard that song so many times. It's stored there now. And the Bible has a lot to say about your mind. The Bible doesn't really care all that much about your feelings. Now, God gave you your feelings, but your feelings are pretty much irrational. Your feelings have no IQ. You can't educate your feelings. They just are what they are. But the Bible says it's the truth that sets you free. It's not your feelings. You can be driving down the road and somebody cuts you off on the freeway and you feel like gassing it and ramming into the back of them, right? See, your feelings are pretty much irrational. God gave them to you and they're beautiful things. But God never wants you to make decisions based upon your feelings. He wants you to make decisions based upon the truth. And what happens is, is one of the great forces in our culture is music. And when you listen to music, whether it be in your car, at work, wherever it is, it's having an impact on your life. And most of that impact is pretty much negative. 
I mean, literally in our culture today, you can listen to music from the moment you get up. I mean, we have, you know, alarm clocks that, you know, you wake up in the morning and the music's going, right? And you get up and you make your way into the bathroom. You get in your car. If you're a student, you go to school and you put your earphones on. You get in your car to drive home. You get home, you turn on your radio. And then you call me up and go, Pastor Rick, I'm just not here from God. <laughs> What's my problem? I just, I just don't seem like God's talking to me. No, I can guarantee you God's talking. The problem is we fill our minds with stuff. And most of it's pretty much crap. It has no intrinsic value whatsoever. Um, what's that great song? You know, Bow! cut off your left leg. Woo! Cut off your right leg. Woo! Let's dance. Now, I'm not the smartest guy on the planet. I'm, I'm a pretty much educated guy. Cut off your left leg. Okay. Cut off your right leg. Okay. Let's dance. Now, Kevin, I know that means something to the kids. I know, I know it does. I just don't know what. What does that mean? Somebody help me. And that's pretty tame. One of the most popular songs that won a Grammy was a song that they had to change the lyrics of because they couldn't play it on the radio. It was a song by CeeLo. And everybody's listening to this great song. And when the kids went and bought the song, it wasn't the same lyrics as you were hearing on the radio. And it was just F you through the whole song. And the Grammy said, that's the best song of the year. Wow. That's the best song of the year? F-U, F-U, and it wasn't F-U. Really? That's the song that a bunch of people got together and said, that's the best song out of all the songs that have been written. That one is the best one. F-U. All the way through. I don't even know how many times it said it. Let me tell you something. I'm not even going to tell you this is the kind of music I tend to listen to. There are all different kinds of really fantastic uh, Christian artists out there that have all kinds of different Christian rap groups, you name it, Christian jazz, all kinds. But it's the kind of music you got to fill your brain with. It's the kind of music you got to have in your car. It's the kind of music you got to have playing in your home. And I'm going to give you a free copy of uh, this as you walk out. And if you want some more music from our worship guys and gals, you can go into the resource center on a weekend and you know buy something else. But this one will at least be uh, at least be free uh, for you. Most of the songs you hear us playing here on the weekend, we've made an album of it, and you can hear it. They may not all be on the same album, but they're on some um, some album. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, this is what I want to do. This ends at eight, right? Every, all the pe important people who run this class are all gone. They're all on a, on a retreat, and I just want to make sure I, I got this. It, it's eight. Is that right? Okay. Um, then let's do this. I want to, I want to get into this uh, a, a little bit here. Um, This past week, I asked you to uh, go home and do lesson one, if you could. But I also told you, it's okay if, man, the week just got so busy, and you were taking care of the kids, your family, your spouse, job, work, 
and you couldn't do any of it, it's okay. Okay, I'm just glad you came back. But I do know that some of you got, got some of it done, and praise the Lord for that. And I also know, as I shared with you last week, some of you went home, and you did the whole thing! Okay, you just got home, and you just started doing it, and you loved doing it, and you just did it. And God made you that way, and there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with being, being made differently. And each week, if you get something done, great. If you don't get it done, that, that's okay. But the, the first lesson that we had you look at was the lesson on uh, the Bible. And so uh, I, I kind of want to maybe delve into that a little bit and, and talk a little bit about that and maybe answer some questions uh, along the way. I'm, I'm going to start right here with this verse up on the Jumbotron. It says this, this was one of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples, his closest band of buddies, before he left. He gathered up all these men and he said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and because I have all authority, I want you to go and I want you to make disciples of all the nations, I want you to baptize those new disciples in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and I want you to teach those new disciples to obey all the commands that I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And this is an important um, verse for a guy like me who oversees a church, because what Jesus was saying was, was look, I want to make sure that you're going, Jesus said, and you're making disciples of people. This class right here, the follow class, is one of the ways we fulfill this command of the Lord. Jesus said, I want you to make disciples of people. I want you to baptize them. I want you to teach them things that are in here, and I want you to encourage them to actually do what's in here. And so this class is one of the many ways that we fulfill this command from, from Jesus. It's how we help people become disciples of the Lord. Next week, I'm going to talk to you about baptism. I know many of you haven't been baptized, and I'm going to talk to you about that next week. Always, the, the class that I teach, the follow class, um, We'll do a big baptism on a weekend, and I will be the one who will baptize you. And I don't do that very often, but I do baptize those that are in this class that I get a chance to um, uh, kind of do life with here. So if um, that's something that you think you'll be interested in, next week we'll have some information as to when that baptism will be. It'll be in July, and uh, I'd love to have you be a, a part of it. It's this last phrase down here that's really interesting. Jesus told these guys, hey guys, I want you to know something. I'm going to be with you. You're not going to do this alone. And that's an important thing because um, every one of the guys that he would have been with, but one of those guys, all died a horrible death. That they did what Jesus said. They went out and started telling other people about, about Jesus. And all of them but one um, were, were killed, murdered, martyred, simply because they just told people about Jesus. In fact, the one who you probably all would know is Peter. Peter was put on a cross just like Jesus, nailed to a cross. That's how he died. And when they put him on that cross, he told his captors, look, I'm not worthy to die like Jesus died. And so they took that cross and they put it upside down. And so Jesus, uh, Peter died upside down on a cross. It's not easy to be a follower of the Lord. In fact, let me just tell you right now, statistics say this, 
I'll cut this room in half. In about five years, half of you in this room won't want anything to do with the Lord. You won't be following the Lord. You won't be going to church. You won't be serving anywhere in the church. If you're single, you won't marry somebody who's a follower of Christ. Half of you. Now, I don't know which half it's going to be. And that's just not true for this church. That's just true for the church in America. You see, it's one thing to say, hey, I want to be a follower of the Lord. That's pretty easy to do. It's another thing to actually be a follower of the Lord. <laughs> that, that's a whole other gig. Saying that you want to be a follower is great. That, that's fantastic. But, but, the, but the deal is, is that you have to obey. You, ha you have to be somebody who actually follows the Lord. And here's the deal. In our culture today here in America, and I've been here at Big Valley Grace for over 30 years, uh, it, it's pretty brutal. Pretty brutal to be a follower of the Lord today. You're a hater. You're a bigot. You, you, uh, you would be... Uh, It'd probably shock if, if, if I were to just bring in some of the emails that I get from people. People who listen to the, the internet, they watch the broadcast that literally goes out all over the world. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people watch it on the weekends who aren't in our church. There are organizations out there that just watch it. They don't believe, it, they don't believe in God. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't care about any of that. All they're doing is just wait, waiting to see what I have to say. And then they'll take a line here and a line there and they'll make some big deal about it and send off some crummy things about me or send it to other people. But it will happen to you too. And here's the thing. <laughs> There'll come a moment where some of you will go, hey, this ain't worth it. My friends don't want to hang out with me anymore. I'm not getting invited to the cool parties anymore. I, 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 I don't want, I, I don't need this in my life. And so in five years, maybe less than five, maybe a little more than five, you'll just go, I'm done. And you still might believe in the Lord maybe, but you're certainly not following him. And the reason why Jesus said, I'm going to be with you, is because we need him with us. We need Jesus with us. It, he knew it wasn't going to be easy. He's put on a cross. He understood. And he said, hey, listen, they hated me. They're going to hate you. It's just the way it goes, man. And so one of the great promises is that Jesus is going to be with you as a disciple. He'll be with you. He'll walk with you. Now, that doesn't mean your life's going to be easy. Peter dies. James, his half-brother, the one who wrote the book of James, he was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, he ended up being thrown off the temple wall. Boom, he lands on the ground and he's not dead. So they ran out and just beat him with clubs. All of the original disciples but one died a horrible death and even the one, it wasn't a good gig and that was John. John dies in a prison, in a, crum in a crummy prison. And so I'm not telling you that you will die. You might. There are Christians today on our planet right now in some places on the globe who are dying. And they're not dying because they're tall or short or heavy or skinny. They're not dying because they're Dodger fans or Giants fans. They're dying simply because they're followers of Jesus. They're my brothers in the Lord. They're my sisters in the Lord. And so Jesus said, look, I want you to go and make disciples, and don't forget, I'm going to be with you. You won't do it alone. You'll need me in your life, because it could get a little dicey following me. And certainly in our culture today, it's, um, it's a little dicey. Okay, so here we go. Uh, chapter one was the Bible. I think it's called uh, your, your user's guide for life. And uh, let's see here. 
Let me do this. There, there it is. I'm going to start with just a couple of passages here that weren't in your book. The psalmist says, this was probably King David who wrote this, said, the heavens proclaim the glory of God, the skies display his craftsmanship, day after night they continue to speak, night after night they make him known, they speak without a sound or word, their voice is never heard. And what, what, what David's saying is, maybe he was out, and uh, he was around the En Gedi, around the, 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 the Dead Sea, and maybe he was looking up, and he saw the stars, and he saw the sky, and he saw the moon, and he saw the sun, and he saw all that kind of stuff, and he went, wow. It's just so obvious that there has to be a God. The heavens declare the glory of God. They speak, though they don't say a word. Another modern day translation might be, you know, you just go to El Capitan, you know, in Yosemite and just look at that and just go, whoa, that's unbelievable. Uh, I'm a gardener and I love to garden. And my favorite flower, without a doubt, is a Gerber daisy. I'm going to tell you something. Those are just unbelievable. You just look, look at them and you just go, wow, that's just crazy. Those are just unbelievably beautiful. And so the Bible says that, that the heavens, the, the, the earth, the things on the earth, they, they tell us something about God. In Romans, it says this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. They've been understood from what has been made so that men, people, women, or without excuse. In other words, you can look at just what God has created and go, you know what? There has to be a God. You can't miss God in creation. You can't miss it. People are without an excuse. Now, people can say, ah, there's no God. I don't believe in a God. And by the way, everybody starts off as an atheist. <laughs> Everybody in this room was an atheist at one time or another. N nobody comes out of the womb, you know, a believer, a disciple. We all come out of the womb apart from God. Some of us may have came to Christ early in our lives. Some may have been later in our lives. But at some moment, you know, we were all apart from God. And what the Bible says in these two passages and others is that you can look at just what God's created and go, man, there's got to be a God. This is unbelievable. And let me give you an illustration here. Um, I worked in the jewelry business for a lot of years. And uh, my parents owned some jewelry stores. And I made jewelry. I repaired jewelry. I did all that kind of stuff. I repaired watches and something I really enjoyed doing. Um, is there anybody in this room who'd be willing to stand up and say that this watch put itself together? No, nobody, yeah. So you're smarter than that. Um, obviously, this watch had to have somebody that put it together. There are 23 moving parts in this watch. It's pretty intricately made. It, this watch took some intelligence to put together. It could not make itself. It's impossible that this watch would make itself. There's not a biology teacher at Davis or Downey or Bayer or Modesto or Enox or wherever who would say that watch put itself together. There's not a college professor in the country, outside of the country, who would stand up in front of their students and say, this watch put itself together. No, obviously it had a maker. Obviously somebody that had some intelligence put this together. In fact, the company's name was Nixon. They actually put the name right there. Nixon is the one who made this watch. Some of your watches may say Bulova or Seiko or Timex, but somebody made it. Nobody's going to stand up and go, that thing made itself. 
But let me take it down even a step farther. Um, this right here has three moving parts. Three. It's got the little springy deal. It's got the chiropractic neck adjuster. <laughs> and it has the little plate where this food is served, basically. Three moving parts. Three. Anybody in this room want to stand up and go, that made itself? That created itself? It's only got three moving parts. No. There's not a biology teacher on the planet that would stand up in front of a group of high school students and say, that made itself. There's not a big shot professor with a PhD pass his name who would stand up in front of his students and say, that made itself. Obviously, this had a creator. Now, it didn't take as much as in intelligence as that, but it took some intelligence. It has three moving parts. I could take those three moving parts and stick them all down here on the ground. I'll even put them all together right next to each other and give it a billion years. How about two billion? Five billion? Oh, pick a billion. I guarantee you that in a billion or five billion or 10 billion years, whatever the number is, pick a number, they're not gonna crawl together and create this. Somebody, Tomcat, a guy named Tomcat, a guy named Nixon, put this together. Three moving parts. And yet in every high school in America, public high school, in just about every college campus on, in America today, this put itself together. A billion years went by, two molecules got together. Swam in some nishish, nashish, nishish, nish. <laughs> Swam around for a billion years. Stuck its head out of the water, saw a tree. Thought I need to get to that tree. But I don't have any lungs. Another billion years went by and there was a set of lungs. Then there was a circulatory system. <laughs> a circulatory system. Three moving parts. Your eyeball. And then it crawled up on a beach. <laughs> but it didn't have enough legs to get up. So another billion years went by and its legs grew. And then it finally stuck up a hand and took the fruit. You didn't create yourself. You didn't have a maker. Oh, this? Are you kidding me? This had a maker. Don't be stupid, Pastor Countryman. Obviously, this thing has three moving parts. It obviously had a maker. You? The intricacy of the human body just made itself. It just evolved, man. Forget about a porcupine. Forget about a zebra. Forget about a Gerber daisy. We live in a world Where, where people buy that. I did. I knew this had to have a maker. But I bought the lie from these people that were influential in my life that, I mean, this is what I want you to do with your hand. Just, just touch it. Just very slight. Your hand can feel the slightest touch. But it can also then take all kinds of abuse, but it can feel the slightest touch. Isn't that weird? If, if, I, if I threw this at you right now, immediately you'd go, Phew. you wouldn't go, okay, arm up 15 degrees, okay, over 5 degrees, up, down, up. Your brain just moves. Boom. Unbelievable, the human body. Unbelievable. 
let me tell you something. Just listen to me. And I received a few emails, and I'm not trying to mock anybody. This is a part of the deal here. And I'm glad you're here. There, there was a number of you who emailed me and said, hey, I, I'm not a believer. I, I'm actually an atheist. And I told you in the week, first week, I'm glad you're here. I don't, care. I don't care why you're here. I'm just glad you're here. I'm not trying to mock anybody. I'm just trying to make a, a pretty simple illustration here. That this has three moving parts and basically two wood and metal. It's not an eyeball that has to work in conjunction with your circulatory system and your skeletal system and your nervous system. Forget all that. It's just a piece of wood and some metal with three moving parts. And obviously, somebody put this together with some intelligence. That took some more intelligence. Imagine the intelligence it must have taken to put together a human life. Unbelievable. Listen, not only do the heavens proclaim the glory of God, just look in a mirror. A mirror will tell you, whoa. You may not know who God is. You may not understand them all by looking at the, the, the stars and the heavens and a Gerber daisy and, and the human body doesn't tell you about the love of God or the mercy of God or the compassion of God. All those things don't tell you details about God. They just go, dude, unbelievable. Whew. Certainly, when you look at a Gerber daisy and all the different colors, you can see that maybe God's very creative. You, you can look at El Capitan and go, man, God's got to be super powerful maybe. You can look at the human body or just look at your spleen and just go, dude, man, he's just like off the chart smart. The reason why this book is so important is this is the book that God left us so that we would know details about the God who created it all. See, without this book, I don't know that much about God. I just know he's unbelievable. I, I, I just know he's, he's, he's powerful or I know he's, he's organized. You can look at, at nature and just see how organized God is, how trees grow, the way they grow, the reason why they're wide at the bottom and tall at the top. You can just see a God who's super organized. This is what tells us about God, his love, his caring, his nurturing, his compassion, his wrath. This is super important. And here's the thing. The difference between an evangelical church like us and a cult is a cult would never have you in a class like this and send you out with Bibles and say, read the Bible on your own. They want to control you. Usually when you see a cult, it's very small. Cults don't have churches this size. I can't, I can't even control my own family of five, let alone 5,000, right? I'm not trying to control you. I don't want to control you. I just want you to read the scriptures on your own. I want you to enjoy this God who wrote this book for you, John. He wrote it for you. He wrote it for you. He just didn't write for me. He left pastors here to help kind of explain it to, to people. But I don't fear you going home and reading the scriptures on your own. I don't fear that. I encourage that. Because I know it's in this book right here that you'll get to know this incredible God who put you together, who gave us the brains to make a little object like this that has three moving parts. They gave us the brains to make a dumb object like that that has 23 moving parts. They gave us the brains to do all the things that we do. And so I'm glad that the first lesson is on um, the Bible. Now, 
Psalms 14, in a number of different spots, it says this. The Bible makes a statement. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And here's the deal. Now listen to me. <laughs> Let me tell you why the fool says there's no God. Um, because the fool doesn't want there to be a God. Because if there is a God, uh-oh, there could be trouble. You see, people don't want there to be a God. Because if there is a God, we know we're not gods, right? And so all of a sudden, what does that do? It immediately puts us in a weird place as a human being. It puts us in a very subservient place. What does this God require of me? And if they can't convince themselves that there's no God, you know what they do? They create a God that will tolerate their sin. You see, the one thing that we all have in common that science just can't get a handle on is that thing called your conscience. Pesky little thing. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Billions of years. <laughs> no. See, God, the Bible tells us, give, gave us a conscience. And what does a conscience do? It tells us what's right and what's wrong. You know when you're going to do something that's wrong. How do you know that? Because the Supreme Court tells you that? Because the governor makes a law? How do you know? You see, God gave you a conscience. And that conscience lets you know, I've done something wrong. And when you do something wrong, what comes along with that, mom, dad? There's a consequence. There's a punishment. And so what happens is you don't want to think that there's a God, and so you work real hard to say there's no God, there's no God. And if I can't get that thought out of my mind, then I'll create a God that's okay with my sin. It'll tolerate my sin. Or I'll, I'll find a church that'll tolerate my sin. Certainly there's a preacher out there that doesn't really believe everything that's in this book. I'll find a place that I can go, whew, okay, they're okay with my sin. Now I'm okay with it. And so one of the things that I'm okay with is you, whether you're a believer in Jesus or you're not. I'm okay with the fact that you would read the Bible on your own. I'm not afraid of you reading the Bible. You're not going to find anything in there where you go, look, there's a mistake here, there's an error here. I know there's all kinds of people out there who tell you all kinds of mistakes in the Bible. There aren't any. There's none. They're manufactured. This book um, that you all have has mistakes in it. You know why? Because it wasn't written in English. It was written in Hebrew and in Greek, primarily. And what happened was, was that none of you in this room speak Hebrew. You don't speak Greek. The king, his name was James, didn't speak English. But he wanted to read the Bible on his own. So what he did was, he got a whole bunch of really smart scholars, Greek scholars, Hebrew scholars, who took the Hebrew manuscripts and the Greek manuscripts and they looked at all these words and they began to make an English Bible. And when those words were translated from the Hebrew and the Greek into English, there were some mistakes that were made. Because the Hebrew language and the Greek language are way different than the English language. And let me give you an example of that. I'm going to keep it real simple for you, okay? Um, we say things like, I love my wife and I love pizza. <laughs> really? Come on. Do you love your wife like you love pizza? 
No, but it, we just use one word that we have, and we call it love. And so we use it for lots of different things. The Greeks were, um, uh, their language is way more precise. So they didn't have one word for love. They had five or six different words for the word love. And so um, the Hebrew writers, the, the Greek scholars, they would get to the word um, stergos. That's a Greek word for love. And so they get to stergos, they take stergos, they make it love in the English, and stergos is um, a love that, I don't know, uh, two you know, bears have for each other, or that a mama bear has for its baby bears. It's just kind of a natural kind of love. Uh, uh, you see a little kitty, kitten that has little kittens. Well, the mother loves, has a stergos love for the, for the little babies. It's just a natural kind of love. Um, there's the word eros in the Greek. Eros is where we get our English word erotica. That's a different kind of love, an erotic kind of love. But when the Greek scholars got to eros, they just translated it love. Well, obviously, stergos love, love that uh, uh, a cat has for its kittens, is different than erotic kind of love, right? And then there was um, uh, uh, phileo love. We get our word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, right? So the Greek scholars get to the word phileo, which is a brotherly love. Man, I know Kevin. Kevin and I are friends. We have a phileo love for each other. It's a brotherly kind of love. But when the scholars got to phileo, they just translated it love. The love that God has for us is called agape. Agape love is an unconditional love. It's just a love, I love you no matter what. Not because you do anything for me. Not because you're one of my kittens. Not because we're brothers. It's just because. But they got to that word, agape. And they translated it love. And so all through the New Testament, you see the word love, 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 love. But those words love, that word love could mean steros, uh, uh, stergos, or eros, or phileo, or agape. And sometimes we preachers have to let you know what that love is so it makes a little bit more sense in the text. Make sense? Now, I don't want you to think that the Bible you're reading is full of all kinds of errors. It's not. But the errors that you tend to find or some dumb professor will bring to my attention, you just go, dude, you're like really dumb, aren't you? How did you get this job? Because what they're doing is they'll show me something in English instead of going to what it was originally written in, the Greek or the Hebrew, you see. The book that you have, the Bible, your English Bible, is pretty good. But there are some translations that aren't really as sharp as they ought to be. Let me give you a real fun one. When the Greek scholars, when King James wanted to have a Bible that he could read, they got to the word baptism. It was a Greek word, baptismo. And the word baptismo really means to be submerged. The king had been sprinkled. Who's going to tell the king? They never translated the word. They just took the word baptismo, moved it into the English, and it's where we, still, it's where we get our word baptism. Same word, they just never translated it right. Because nobody wanted to go to the king and say, you know, it really means you ought to be submerged. <laughs> now, does it mess up? The integrity of the Word of God? No. Baptism. I don't care whether you've been sprinkled. It doesn't matter to me. But the point is, is that you have an English Bible, and that's good, so you can read it. But the Bible wasn't actually written in, Greek, in English. It was written in Greek and Hebrew. 
And you can have good confidence that the Bible you have, if you have a good version, a new international version, NIV, or a new living translation, or a new American standard, or the King James version, or the new King James version, or the ESV, those are all great versions. Now, there's some really crummy versions out there where they have really butchered the translation. But most of you have a, a, a good Bible, and so I'm answering a number of questions that came in on email and trying to make it all fit here. Anyway, that, that made some sense, I, I, I hope. If not, there's always next week, right? Um, okay. Psalms 18 says this. Now we're going to kind of get into it a little bit. It says, as for God, and by the way, you read this. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, question. Say, say that again, Richard. Well, here's it. Let me say this, Richard. Let me just say it this way. Um, because of all of the passages in the scriptures that deal with baptism, Good churches and good denominations don't always see baptism the same. And so I have some great brothers and sisters in the Lord that come from, um, that come from a different um, tradition than I do, and they may sprinkle. And they're still my brother in the Lord, they're still saved, they're still going to heaven and all that kind of stuff. I don't get hung up on some of those kinds of things. Um, some churches will pour water over your head. You know what? Uh, I don't get hung up on that, those things. I think what's important is that a person is baptized. Now here, we baptize a particular way here. We have our own traditions here at this church. The only thing I would say is this, is that to me it's crystal clear that baptism is for a believer. Baptism is a moment where we declare, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, I'm saved, I've given my life to Christ, and now I'm following the Lord in baptism. And so when an infant is baptized, which I was baptized at eight days old in the Catholic Church, when I was eight days old, all I was doing was pooping in my pants. I don't remember anything. So how, I wasn't a follower of the Lord. I wasn't a follower of anything. I, I didn't know anything. And so I, I do think, and by the way, the Catholics aren't the only ones that baptize infants. There are others. I think that that is a distinction that, that's important, that a believer is baptized. And, and sometimes you can be four or five years old and really understand your salvation, and we baptize kids that are four and five as long as they understand the implications of what's happening. But we would never baptize a baby because how can a baby stay, say, I'm, I'm a follower of, of, of Christ? And so the fact that somebody is baptized as an infant, we always will tell people you should be baptized again. Not that when I was baptized when I was eight, it was evil or wicked. My dad loved me. He thought this was part of the way I was going to be saved. So, hey, man, I'm going to take him and, you know, whatever the guy did. I don't know. I don't know what he did. I'm just glad he didn't leave me in the thing. I'm, but uh, so, so anyway, so you're, you're asking a, 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 a great question. And by the way, in our baptism class, and we have one, we talk way, way more uh, uh, about that. But let, let me keep moving here, because I only got about 20, 20 minutes here. The Bible says this, in a number of different ways, in a number of different locations. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is 
flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. Um, over and over again throughout the, the, the Bible, God says that, that, that this is flawless. It's perfect. God doesn't say it's easy. God doesn't say you're going to understand it all. God doesn't say it's all going to make sense to you. God doesn't say it's, it's all going to be logical to you. Because there's a lot in this book that doesn't make sense to me. It's illogical to me. There's a lot in this book that God calls me to that are, that are, are hard, that are difficult. This weekend, I, I think I shared in the, in the message, I think it was this weekend, that God says to me, Rick, my word is perfect. And I want you to love your enemies. I want you to pray for them. Oh. Well, that didn't make any sense to me. And God says, well, I don't care whether it makes sense to you, Rick. Well, I don't like that. I don't care whether you like it, Rick. Well, I don't, I don't want to do it. Rick, I don't care what you want. What matters is, is my word's perfect. My word's flawless. And if it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't matter. Just do it. Doesn't matter whether you like it, just do it. I'm God and you're not. Rick, you'd have a hard time putting this thing together. It's got three moving parts. I put it all together. Just do what I say. And then he makes this interesting statement here. He, that's God, his word is a shield for all who take refuge in him. And you've got to think back to it was written about uh, almost 4,000 years ago. And a shield was an interesting piece of uh, equipment that soldiers would have had. And King David was a warrior. He would have had a shield. And um, a shield might be something where a bad guy's got a bow and arrow. And all of a sudden, David goes, oh! And he throws up his shield, and all of a sudden, there's an arrow stuck in his shield. And it protected him. Maybe he was in a battle with a guy, and they're going at it, and the guy whips out his sword, and he goes, Brink! We've all seen those movies, right? And the shield protected him. And what God says to his people is this. This book is a shield for your life. It'll protect you if you live by it. And let me give you an example. Um, I'm going to talk about this this weekend a little bit. The Bible's crystal clear that God created this thing called sex. Okay? <laughs> Unbelievable. And God knew what he was doing. It's one of the great creations of all time. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that when you enter into a covenantal relationship with a, with a gal or a guy, at that moment when you make vows to one another before God and witnesses, something incredible happens. The Bible says that her body no longer belongs to her, but it belongs to the man now. Okay, okay, now we're talking. Now we're talking, God. There are some things that make some sense. Okay, there are some things that I like. Got no problem with that one, Lord. And then the Bible says that the guy's body no longer belongs to him, but it belongs to the, to the gal. In other words, God says, Woohoo! I got something for you. This is great! You, you, you can enjoy each other's body in the context of a kind of covenantal relationship. It's a beautiful thing. Now, when you follow the Lord, that's a good thing. But some people say, you know what? I don't care what God says. I like sex. Sex is a great thing. And I'm not going to wait till I'm married. I got desires. I'm going to fulfill my desires. I don't care what anybody says. 
And so you blow God off. Now guess what happens? You got no shield. And now you're defenseless. And so what happens oftentimes, you see, what a, what a condom can't protect you from is a broken heart. See, it's tragic to me to see what's happened to, to God's people. They've taken the shield down and no longer is there the protection of, of pain and sorrow. Uh, gonorrhea, how about that? There's a good one. How about uh, herpes? There's one. How about AIDS? Boy, let's just, what, what are unwanted pregnancies, man? The list goes on and on and on and on and on because people said, you know what? Who cares about this? I'm going to do it my way. And God says, oh, don't. My word is a shield for you. It will protect you against heartache and pain and diseases. And some of those diseases could literally kill you. It'll protect you from unwanted pregnancies. It'll protect you from pain and sorrow. But people make the decision. I know it's perfect. I know it's flawless. I don't even believe it. So I'm going to go do whatever I want with my life. And they no longer have the shield anymore. And so uh, we, we live in a country that just has a whole lot of heartache and pain. And most of it's on the woman's side because men and women are just different. I know we live in a culture where we're trying to um, take away the beauty of femininity and the beauty of masculinity, but there is an incredible beauty in those two things. Masculinity and femininity, boy, when it comes together, it's unbelievable. And men are different than women. We're not better than women, we're different. Women, you're not better than us guys just because you get to carry babies around inside your wombs. I mean, what an incredible thing. You get to actually produce life and watch it move. And it comes out of your body. Life comes out of your body. Life, uh, 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 you know, is feeding at your breasts. That, that's unbelievable. That doesn't mean God likes you more or loves you more because you get those great joys. No. Men and women are different. We're different. And when it comes to, and I chose sex, maybe because I'm going to talk a little bit about it this weekend, the person who tends to get the most hurt, the most broken, is the woman. Because you, you sex it means something different to you than it does to a guy. Way different. That's why most Porn stuff is all goofing up guys. Now, that's not to say girls don't get goofed up in it, but the overwhelming majority of porn is all meant for guys. Why? Because we, we process things different. And um, God says, listen, and, and I, I, I could pick a lot of topics that God talks about, but God says, man, my way is perfect. My way is flawless. You may not like it. You, you may struggle with it. But if, if you'll live by it, if you'll obey it, if you'll follow it, even if it doesn't make sense, it'll protect your life. It'll protect your family. How many families have been ripped apart because two people that have entered into a covenantal relationship? I do. I do. And this incredible thing happens. These two people become one. Unbelievable. And they have this relationship. And one of them says, you know what? I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to go out and have an affair. Look, in my 30 years, sir, I've seen the devastation that an affair does. I've seen the pain and the heartache. He's a shield. He'll protect you. He'll protect your family. If you'll just live by this. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it's hard. And it may be hard. 
Just commit yourself that this is going to be the way I live, even if I don't understand it all. And there will be much in here you want to understand. Now, here's the thing. This is not everything there is to know about God. <laughs> what kind of God would he be if you could put it in this book? I have a manual to my car that's almost bigger than this. <laughs> okay? Don't, don't be mistaken here. This isn't everything there is to know about God. This is just what God wanted you to know for now. And then the Bible says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, you can write that down. The secret things belong to the Lord. In other words, there are some things that God just chooses not to tell you. They're secret to only him. And here's the deal, man. If we could know everything there was to know about God, like, as I said, what kind of God would, would he be? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving on here. Okay, now, uh, Peter said this. All men... All humanoids, <laughs> we're like the grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. And what happens to the grass? It withers, and it, you know, and, and the flowers fall. In other words, as beautiful as my Gerber daisies are, they don't last forever. Beautiful as I manicure my lawn with this new drought, can't water my lawn on a Monday <laughs> or a Tuesday <laughs> or a Wednesday, and I got brown spots, man. The grass will fade. The flowers will fade. You will fade. One day you will die. Probably all of us in here have experienced death. Randy just lost a loved one. We probably all have. But the word of the Lord, it's not like the grass. It's not like the flowers. It's not like anything else. It will remain forever. Forever. This is something that you can base your life on. This year, next year, you could train up your children and they could live by it. Your grandchildren, they could live by it. Then you could die. Some of you maybe were trained by your grandfather or your great-grandfather. And they're, they're dead now, but guess what? This thing just keeps living on forever and ever. Never has to be changed. Doesn't have to be updated. Hey, we got a new and improved one. No, that's what you do with Ritz crackers about every three years. New and improved. There's no new and improved. This is the same book that's been around the Old Testament for thousands of years, the New Testament for 2,000 years. Joshua in the Old Testament said, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that's written in it. Because when you do what's written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. And because there's so many crazy, wacky guys on TV that will teach you that, you know, if you just do all the right things, God will make you rich. That word right there doesn't mean prosperous in the sense of financial prosperity. It could. It could. It just simply means that your life will be prosperous. And I shared this weekend, I know some people in our church. I know a guy in our church, he's a mechanic. The guy busts his hump every week, puts in about 60 hours a week. He goes, punches in, punches out, walks out, grease all over his hands, grease all over his face, Probably makes about 10, 15 bucks an hour. He, he's just barely scraping by. But let me tell you something. The guy's prosperous. His family is so beautiful. His children are off the hook beautiful. They're the salt of the earth kind of kids you'd want to know, kind of meet. It's kind of kids I want my kids to marry and date, all that kind of stuff. His family is prosperous. And by the way, listen, I, I don't care whether your kids are straight A students or not. I don't care whether your kid's the best athlete on the team or not. They, I heard Ted Bundy was a, was a straight-A student. I heard, I heard that, uh, I don't know, you know, Charlie Manson was through great parties. 
What I care about is, are your kids good kids? Are they salt of the earth kind of kids? I mean, are, 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 they, are, they, are they just, you know, the, 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 the light of the world kind of kids? I don't care whether they get good, good grades or not. Hey, my, my kid's a straight-A student. He just got out of prison, but he's a straight-A student. I don't care whether your kid's a straight-A student. I mean, is he serving the Lord? No. I, I don't care whether he's a straight-A student or not. God doesn't care whether he's a straight-A student or not. God doesn't care whether your kid can throw a football 50 yards or not. The goal isn't that you raise a kid that has straight A's. If, if you do that, praise the Lord. The goal is that you raise a godly kid. A salt of the earth kind of kid. A kid that somehow will make a difference in this, in this world. And by the way, they can have straight A's. But we got our values all, all goofed up. Point of, point of what Joshua is saying here is this. It's this book. Not only is it a shield, but you know what? When you live by it, Probably going to have some success. You may not be wealthy. Um, Mother Teresa didn't have two nickels she could rub together. Anybody want to stand up and say her life wasn't successful? Anybody want to say she wasn't a prosperous woman? <laughs> she, she didn't have 10 cents. But her life was unbelievably beautiful. So don't somehow think that you know, if I follow the Lord, if I just do everything he says, man, I'll be a billionaire. You might. And if you are, take me to lunch, man. I'll, you know, I'm, all, I'm good with it. <laughs> but you may not. But your life will be beautiful. Your life will be just, just unbelievably beautiful. Um, King David said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. And the thought there is, is that you would know what God's word says so that you would live by it. Just because you know God's word doesn't mean you won't sin. A lot of people know God's word and they sin. It's the fact that now I know what God says and now I can make the choice as to whether I want to follow God or not, you see. And that's why it's important to know what God says. So that you can make the choice not to sin. That, 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 make, that makes some sense, right? Um, all scripture, all of it, is inspired by God. And I, I shared with you that that phrase right there, inspired by God, simply means that, that God breathed it. That God's Holy Spirit came upon the writers of the Bible and in their own personalities, they wrote what they wrote because God told them basically what to write. And it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. This. Now some of the things that God says are right, you're not gonna like. Some of the things that God says are wrong, you're probably not gonna like. But he didn't necessarily make this. He gave Tomcat the brain to make this. He created you. He created it all. And whatever he tells you to do, whatever he says is right, whatever he says is wrong, you can argue all you want. But you're not going to change his mind. You might be able to change your kid's mind, your spouse's mind. You might be able to change somebody else around the, your table's mind but you'll never change his mind. I was asked the other day, it was an, I was doing an interview with a magazine, and they were asking me a question, don't you want to be on the right side of history? <laughs> I said, no. I want to be on the right side of scripture. That's what I want to be on. I'm not worried about how history plays itself out. I just want to be on the right side of this. Not on the right side of history. And that is the thought behind a disciple of the Lord. We may not be on the right side of history. In fact, if I understand this book right, uh, those of us that know the Lord, the, the history is not going to be real good for us at the end. But this is what I want to be on the right side of. And I want you to be on the right side of it. 
I want this to be the thing that you say, look, I realize where history's going. I realize where our culture's going. I realize where morality's going and all those kinds of things. And let me just say this. We're not even going to get through any of this. <laughs> it's all right. Who cares? All right. Uh, I, I want to I give you a little, a little, little thought here on, on morality. Just, just real quick, just a little lesson here. There is a difference between morality and ethics. Now, the world wants to put them together, and I'm going to show you why here in a minute. But there is a difference between morality and ethics. And it's important that we keep those two things separated. And let me show you why. Morality is just what is. That's morality, you write that down. Morality is just what is. Um... For instance, uh, morality, and by the way, morality changes. Um, there was a time in our, our nation's history where abortion was wrong. It was immoral to do that. Morality changed, didn't it? For a lot of people. Um, we're watching morality change as it relates to weed. And I used to smoke a lot of it. And there's an argument to be made that marijuana isn't as destructive as alcohol. That's not the, my argument. Uh, my argument is, dude, do we need another narcotic that's legal? Really? I mean, do, don't we have enough troubles? Our morality is changing, right? We're changing laws and things like that. In our state, it's illegal for a woman or a guy to sell their body. Prostitution's illegal. It's not moral in our state. You go over one state, and the morality changes, doesn't it? You can actually go to whorehouses, and, 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 and it's legal there. So morality changes. It's, morality is just what is. And usually what determines what's moral is, have you got a powerful army? Or you get enough votes. And those are the two things that tend to shift morality. Okay? So mor morality, you go over to, to you know, some European countries, and they have naked dancing ladies in windows. See? As dudes are smoking weed, snorting coke, going down the road. The morality there is different than it is here. Ethics. Now listen to me. Ethics asks a way deeper question. Ethics isn't worried about what is. Ethics asks the question, what should be? And that's why the world wants to lump those two things together. If we can make morality and ethics one, then we don't ever have to think about the question of what should be. Nobody likes dealing with that question. Should we have more drugs? Should we be murdering 1.2 million babies? Shouldn't the womb be the safest place on the planet? Shouldn't it? I don't know. I just, let's at least wrestle with the question. What, what should be? And when you get to this, <laughs> this deals with the ethical things. God says this is the way it's supposed to be. I'm not worried about what is. This is the ethics of life. It's also the morality of life. But nobody really wants to deal with the ethical questions in our culture today. That's too hard. I'd rather just deal with what, hey, 52% of the people say this. So it's got to be right. Okay, so 52% of the people say this. You're right, the majority say this. Let's stop and ask this question. Should it be? Well, 52% of the people say it is. Well, I, who cares about what the majority thinks? What matters is, is what should be. And those are the kinds of things that God says, listen, I want you to know what should be. The culture may be ramming something down your throat. You, as one of his followers, need to read this, know this, 
base your life on this. This is what will tell you what is right and what is wrong. This is the thing that will show you the things that are wrong in your life. This is the thing that will show you the things that are right in your life. Does that make some sense? That make, that makes some sense? All right, so here's the deal. We're, we're way behind. So I'm going to figure out a way next week. When Rick shows up here and Rich next week, don't say anything. You walk in the room and say, man, we got through the whole lesson. Everything was fantastic. Unbelievable. We got through everything we were supposed to get through. Okay? Did you hear that? Remember, hey, what's said in this room stays in this room, right? We're all friends in here. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing. But we'll figure out a way to kind of do this. Now, now next week, you, you, I, I want you to now to, to move on to the, the second lesson, and we'll see if we can kind of maybe do two next week. And um, so you do chapter two. Why is the church important? And I'm going to give you a little hint. Listen, the church isn't this building right here. All this is is brick and mortar, just a tool. The church is not a building. If you know Christ, you're the church. You're it. Let me pray. Father, thanks, Lord, for our time. It just flew by, Lord, at least in my mind. And I, I'm thankful, God, for those that are here that came back. I'm thankful for the new folks that are here. And I'm really excited, God, that, that they at least have some interest in knowing what your word says, whether they believe it or not, whether they're going to follow it or not, at least they would know the importance of the Bible, that for Christians, it's the guidepost to our life. It's where we find our morality. It's where we answer the ethical questions. It's the shield for us. It's your word to us. And may we just have a great time this week digging into it, learning a little bit more about what you say about the church, about us, Lord. Thanks for your goodness to us, and I pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, hey, those of you that brought kids, go get them. Go get your kids. <laughs>